Andrew, welcome to the Your Digital Marketing Coach Podcast. Thanks, Neil. Great to be here. I'm really excited today to dive in to your perspective on marketing for small businesses. I know you also have an expertise in B2B businesses. And for those not familiar with Andrew, I'm going to have him introduce himself uh, briefly. Um, but he is the author of a new book, Marketing for Small B2B Businesses, How Content Creates Marketing Muscle and Powers Traditional and Digital Marketing. This is like music to my ears. A lot of my listeners know I like to say content really is the currency of digital and social media. So uh, I believe we're kindred spirits and I'm really looking forward to unpacking all the advice you have for our listeners. But before we get to that, before we get to the book um, and your company, marketing B2B small business, where did this all start for you? Uh, sort of, I won't say in the pre-internet days, but uh, really early on. Um, I founded the company in 1996, which goes back a ways. I don't think we built our first website until 1998 or so, and we certainly didn't have our own website until at least then. Um, so set top boxes and other sort of marketing tools for company, uh, um, you know, laptop presentations and, and things along those lines. Um, that's really where it started. I was working in uh, digital, I mean, video post-production. And as that industry was going digital, it was, you know, just play, what the writing on the wall was pretty clear. And so um, this is a fascinating thing to get into. And I was just telling someone the other day that there was no, and, and, and in some cases, there was no pressure because we were all figuring it out at the same time. It wasn't like there was someone out there who was an expert. There was no imposter syndrome because we were all imposters. <laughs> we were all sort of trying to figure it out. That's really interesting. Before social media, one of my careers was selling middleware software for set-top boxes. Uh, oh, no apparently kidding. IPTV set that boxes. So who knows? Maybe our, our paths crossed at IBC or uh, one of these, uh, you know, international been. conferences. Very cool. So you start on the video side. So you are the founder and CEO of uh, Andigo. So at what point did you launch the company? And, um, you know, what, what made you create your own company around all that you were uh, doing? Well, I had had another company before this that was uh, sort of focused on a couple of different things. And my co-founder there wanted to go in the direction of uh, consumer work. And I wanted to stick with uh, um, marketing work and consumer, you know, really not uh, marketing work, just actually creating products. And mm -hmm. I thought, gosh, that's an uphill battle as small as we are. You know, people have bigger marketing budgets than we, you know, had capital to start our company with. So um, we split there and that's where I started Andigo. And, you know, coming out of video, we uh, had a lot of contacts in pharma because that, you know, was sort of the lifeblood blood of the video post-production world in New York City back at, in, in those days. Right. And um, so we did a lot of work in the in the pharma industry, in education, um, and pretty quickly, uh, in part because of what happens in New York and, and what kind of companies there are in New York, we were working for a lot of small B2B companies um, uh, and small companies in general. And uh, that's really where things grew. And for us, I would say that there was a big sort of a watershed uh, moment. You know, I mentioned a minute ago that, you know, there was no imposter syndrome because we were all, um, you know, sort of figuring it out as we went. I don't have a background as a, as a um, graphic designer, certainly. Um, I don't really even have a background as a coder, though I've picked up uh, a shocking number of skills over the years. Um, I'm really a message guy. And, you know, so it was all about the message and trying to get a message heard. What should that message be? What was going to be effective? And so, you know, when the big search engines, most notably Google, um, began to pay attention to all the black hat SEO that was going on, you know, the white text on a white background to try and fool people into what a, a website was really about. And they started paying attention to the content on the page. That was that was it for us, and that's where we really sort of came into our own and began building out the content marketing side of the business, as opposed to just the the web development side, the technical side of the business. And so um, we've been running with that ever since. So it sounds like your business has evolved from video to web to content, similar to how marketing has evolved uh, over the past two decades in a very natural and organic way. Yeah, that's a fascinating uh, way to put it. I hadn't thought of that, Neil. So when we say small businesses, it, it's funny, um, you know, there's nothing, a lot of people think small businesses are like, you know, one or two people. Um, and I have friends in the industry that go, no, there's nothing small about small businesses. You know, the, the way you categorize a small business is anything under like a hundred million or anything under a hundred employees. The types of companies you work with, just to give a frame of reference for our listener, when you say small business, what is the sort of scale 
um, in terms of employees or sales that would define a lot of these companies? Yeah, you know, maybe the most amorphous uh, phrase in all of marketing, <laughs> small business, right? Um, it, we very much don't work uh, very often uh, with uh, those one or two person uh, folks, um, uh, you know, a, a traditional two or three person law firm or, you know, a couple of partners in an accounting practice. Um, our our companies, uh, client companies are typically between two and $25 million in, in revenue. Um, size matters less. We do actually work with a couple of solopreneurs um, who really place high value on and get a lot of return from the kind of marketing work that we can do for them. Um, so that's really what the, for us, you know, is the telling tale. Is there going to be a return on the investment we're asking you to make? Because we're not building websites for $3,000 or $5,000. We're not offering, you know, social media management services for $50 a post. Um, that's just not our market, not who we're working with. So it's that two to $25 million range where we um, work most effectively. Uh, we work with some bigger companies as well, but not, um, you know, not certainly not enterprise level or even mid-market type companies. Gotcha. Then from agency, entrepreneur, owner, CEO to author, what prompted you to uh, or inspired you to write this book? Uh, someone asked me to. <laughs> um, I, uh, you know, do a lot of writing for Andigo on uh, Andigo, the, the, our website and on my LinkedIn page and the company LinkedIn page um, and a very uh, variety of other places. And a, a publishing company, A Press, who published this book, uh, found that and approached me and said, hey, would you like to write a book? And um so we uh, negotiated back and forth for a little while on what that book would be about and, you know, sort of what fit their stable and where they had, uh, you know, sort of uh, holes to fill and what fit my expertise. And and this is what came out of that. So I was thrilled. It was uh, really an interesting process. Uh, you know, we're here talking about content marketing, so we can talk about this for a minute if you'd like. It was a, a really interesting process that I had wanted to do for a long time, partly because I'm a writer, you know, basically, and I really wanted to write a book, uh, but also because it's something that is really valuable as a marketing resource for small business owners. And so going through the process was really pretty fascinating. Um, I don't have anything to compare it to in the self-publishing, you know, world. A lot of folks uh, go that route, and I think there are advantages and disadvantages. I'll uh, a press was fantastic to work with, but of course I didn't have complete control over, you know, what the cover of the book looked like, or you know what that, you know, there. If you've got the book nearby, um, I can't even remember the the subtitle, the you know the obligatory very long subtitle that all books seem to have these days, right? That wasn't you know my doing. Um, I don't have any real complaints about it, but you know there are things that you give up um, and things that you gain from from working with someone like having a strong editorial team to say, hey, are you sure this is the direction you want to go in this chapter? Have you have you gotten off off topic here? So um, really interesting process that took me about a year. Yeah, no, I, I've written four books myself. I've done both self-published and I've worked with, with big publishers. So I, I know exactly what you're talking about. But it's really interesting because it also speaks to the opportunity that your publishing content, not only on your own blog, but elsewhere, uh, gave you that exposure where this publisher reached out to you. And this is really when we talk about how content creates that opportunity. Um, that's exactly what happened, right? And then I think you'd agree that that content in the form of a book has a very, very special, it's perceived as a very, very special type of content that becomes a, a, a amazing business card, amazing credibility, something a potential customer can take back and become the trigger to convert them into becoming a lead, a customer. That is absolutely right. I'll share a, a quick story that um, I'll offer as a cautionary tale and a, <laughs> and a, a, a moment of real embarrassment for me. Uh, as we were negotiating the book, actually, I think we had already signed and I was already writing and um, I was asking questions about um, some of the specifics of marketing, who was responsible for what, where, you know, how did the book get onto Amazon, things like that. And I'm on the phone with two of the editors and there's a, a point in the conversation where I don't remember what they said, but I, I can't believe these words came out of my mouth. But I said, well, I don't really care if the book sells. And there was silence for a moment, of course. And then, you know, they said, we kind of care. And I was like, no, no, of course, I, you know, I care if the book sells, but, uh, you know, it's really, it's a marketing tool for me. It's a marketing tool for the business. That's how I plan to use it. And I hope that all the, all the effort I put into promoting the book will uh, turn into sales, but that's not my primary goal. So don't say that to your, your publishers if you don't go the self-published route. <laughs> but actually what's interesting is a lot of publishers secretly want you to say that so they can negotiate, obviously, better terms, right? 
Right. Um, so, you know, it, it's like, well, if you expect to, if you expect to become a millionaire from your book and you want to get this much advance or this much royalties, it, right. that's just unrealistic. So that's actually a very realistic perspective, right? Uh, your it, yeah. book is not to make money, but it is obviously in the business world that, that incredible marketing piece. So I agree hundred percent. Um, you know, I, obviously I want my books to sell as well, but th that is not the primary and I'm going to promote it to my network and my community, what have you. But, of but course. yeah, I, I, I totally get what you're saying and how they might've been, uh, abhorred. I mean, my publisher didn't want me to even start thinking about writing another book until one year after, after my last one published. And I was ready oh. three months later. I was, I had my next book idea to know, no, 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 you need to keep promoting for at least a year or so. Anyway, oh, it's, interesting. A, that's a, yeah, that's it's an interesting, interesting industry, but yeah. this is not a, uh, a how to publish a book podcast, as you all know. So we'll get, <laughs> we'll get back to the topic at hand. So, um, small business marketing and we, you know, you, before we began recording, you talk about this critical piece that small businesses miss most frequently. Um, so what are, I guess, what is like the one thing um, that small business marketers or business owners, entrepreneurs that are, that are listening to this podcast, what is the one thing that, or the most important thing that you think they need to do to be successful with, with marketing? Yeah, the first chapter of my book is titled the, the Marketing Mindset. And one of the things I say in that book, which I say um, uh, far too frequently, probably for the people around me, but um, is the idea that you need to understand that your prospects don't care about you. Your prospects don't even care about what you do. Your prospects care about what you can do for them. So um, that mindset, understanding that marketing isn't about you, marketing has to be about demonstrating that you know and understand the problem that your target audience is experiencing, and then creating content that demonstrates that and provides value to them as they are either trying to solve the problem directly or more likely trying to find out, well, what's the best way for me to solve this problem? What's going to work for my particular situation, my industry, um, my, you know, the state of the, the market and here, what I can afford to spend because the problem is worth X. Um, all those kinds of things. I think we see too much from, from folks in everything from, you know, sort of very small ways, like, you know, everyone's got their pet peeves. As someone who builds websites, I, I look at a website and I see uh, the about uh, item on the main menu as the first thing. I'm like, no, that's wrong. <laughs> you know, that really, no one cares. And no one cares about your, you know, combined decades of experience or the fancy schools you went to. They will care once you make them care. But first, you've got to get there and you've got to make them understand that you 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 get them and their problem and you're worth investing more time in. Even, you know, just... Uh, um, to subscribe to your your email newsletter or listen to your podcast or whatever it may be. And uh, it also, you know, I see it in larger ways as well, where um, just the language on the website is very much about me and us and what we do. And here's our structure. And, you know, again, at some point, you know, there's real value, of course, to having a, a process, you know, with a TM after it, um, you know, just something that you can say, this is a, a key differentiator. There's always going to be value in that. But that's not the first thing people are going to look for. They're going to look for, you know, what, what works for us and, and does this work for us at all? I'm reminded of a quote from Joe Polizzi, the godfather of content marketing, when I, I saw him speak live uh, many years ago. It still sticks with me and I still use it in my presentations, which is 90% of content that companies create is company centric. And only 10% of it is audience centric, where it, it actually should be the other way around. I think you, you speak well to that. It's really interesting. You talked about it from a website copy perspective. I'm assuming once we go off the website into, you know, blog and social media, it becomes even more important, correct? Do you see this mistake a lot of companies make where um, they think they need to talk about something or about themselves or showcase themselves when they're not focused on that end, end customer, that prospect and their needs? Yeah, that's exactly right. And it really does. You're absolutely right. It does come out much more on social media and in, in email marketing. Gosh, I mean, talk about, you know, the hair trigger that most of us have on on hitting the delete button. You really better gr grab their attention, make sure they understand it's about them before you ever, um, you know, hit send yourself. Um, so, yeah, I, I, that is absolutely uh, true. I, I have not heard that Joe Plitzy quote before, but it definitely brings to mind the idea uh, that, Someone I read recently, 80% of uh, content marketing content is never seen by anyone outside the company, which kind of tracks. But if 90% of it is about the company, then that's who's going to care. And you've got to figure out a way around that. 
Yeah, that's so hopefully uh, the listener going forward before you publish or create any content, you'll have that end user, that prospect. And, and it's really funny in, in the YouTube world, they talk a lot about this, the importance of psych, psychography, of really understanding the psychology of that target user. So a lot of what we talk about, it's funny. It, and I've had discussions with other marketing authors that a lot of things that companies need, it really comes down to the basics, like understanding that target persona and then really focusing on that with your content. At, at some point, I think a lot of people, they stray away for whatever reason. Do you, do you find that to be the case as well? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, the classic example of that is, uh, you know, the, the um, syndrome of the next uh, great thing, that, I mean, another new shiny object, object, right? Yeah. Like, you know, it's a new platform or something instead of um, not just, uh, well, certainly not blindly sticking with something um, forever, whether it's working or not, but having a plan going in to say, hey, we're going to try this new platform, this new um, uh, avenue, and here are the metrics that we're going to look at at these uh, points in time to see if it's working, to see if we're making progress and make a decision based on that, not the fact that something new just came out or the fact that you haven't had anyone knock on your door yet uh, based on what you've done there specifically. Because uh, um, depending on the kind of business you have, uh, attribution is really hard. I mean, that is the holy grail, I think, for a lot of us. And it's just super difficult to, to come up with a, a, a foolproof and tight way to make to know, hey, this is the content that got them here. You know, whether it's the last piece or the first piece or a piece in the middle, it's that that is a, a super challenge. I, I imagine you've found something similar. Yeah, um, it's funny. It, it was a, a pharma company that I worked with before. They were questioning the ROI of this is the early days of social media marketing. You know, what's the, what's the ROI? And at some point, you just have to understand it all becomes part of this modern marketing infrastructure. Right. But right. I'd say, well, what's, you know, what's the ROI of your website? It's something that you have to have to do business. And, and the marketer said, actually, our CEO asks us whenever we want to do a website design change, what's the ROI of our website? So right. um, it's, it's, you know, attribution is really funny. And I think it depends on the management team and their expectations and the way I've, I've had, you know, I, I have one of my uh, fractional CMO clients. They're a very small business. They want to go out and buy like, you know, a hundred different variations of the domain name of their brand to protect their brand for the future. There's no immediate ROI from that spend and it's gonna be an annual expenditure of, of maintaining these domains, but it's right. something the CEO says, we have to do this. So right. um, so yeah, there's it's it's a fascinating subject. There's so many different ways of looking at it and it's so opinionated depending on the people in charge of, of the budget and, and the company, so. Agree, and I think it's uh, a little bit, we're sort of, uh, um, you know, being held to the own standard that we've created, right? In the beginning of all this, it's like, hey, you can measure everything. This is gonna be fantastic. And yeah, we can measure this a lot more than you can measure how many people have really looked at that ad in a newspaper, a print newspaper, but, is, you know, what's the value there? Trying to assign value to that and, you know, just deciding what, you know, brand building is versus, you know, lead gen and yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, I, in fact, I, I teach a class on influencer marketing at UCLA Extension. And just last night, a uh, question, I, I showed a case study of someone that they did one of these roundup blog posts, you know, invited 20 industry experts, very effective, especially for B2B companies. And um, they one of the points from the case study was that they achieved 20% increase in brand awareness. So immediately the students like, well, how did they measure that? Right. Oh, good and, question. Yeah. And, and one thing, and you know, there are like with the Facebook ad platform, there's brand lift. There, there's various things you can do that businesses do. One hack, and this is a hack, but if you look at Google Analytics, look at your direct traffic. And while the direct traffic could mean a lot of different things, I just will say, if that is going up, you have more brand awareness. Just keep it very simple, right? Yeah. Um, and, and that person actually nodded and said, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Is it 100% scientifically accurate? Absolutely not. But it does make sense compared to last year. If your direct traffic is up three, four, five times, you're probably known by more people. So I, I like to keep it, try, try to keep it simple and rational, not get 100% accuracy because it's impossible. Yeah, that's especially valuable for smaller companies, right? Who just aren't going to have the the budget um, and, the, and the bandwidth to... to make it complicated anyway. Yeah, no, exactly, exactly. So um, one of the things also we talked about before we hit the record button was you said, and I'm gonna quote you, small business marketers don't need to understand the technical minutia of websites or copy the social media strategies of national consumer brands. They need to know how to build successful marketing machines 
that they can sustain with their available resources. What does a successful marketing machine look like? Well, um, you know, to tie that back to the very beginning of that quote, um, I think people get really uh, hung up on the specifics of, hey, I really have to know how to build a website or maintain a website or understand what my social media marketing metrics mean or, you know, any of a, a thousand really tiny details um, that are tech focused um, and that really matter. And the truth is, unless you're on a crazy, crazy tight budget, you know, it's just you, um, you should be farming that out. You should be working with experts who, you know, particularly on a lot of this online, um, you know, SEO or SEM, where if you're not doing it all day, every day, you're just not going to do a good job. There's just so much detail that you have to dive into to understand why a particular campaign isn't working or what you should be doing to test why one is and what you can do to create another campaign, you know, sub campaign to hit another audience segment. Um, you're just not going to be able to do that unless you either are doing it all day, every day or really dive deep, which probably means as a business owner, a couple of hours a day. Um, that, that most business owners just don't have. So uh, for starters, you really should rely on folks who can who can help you with their expertise because it's not just a matter of knowing, you know, which, which uh, button to click, it's knowing why you're clicking that button. So to me, that's the first step. Um, the second step is understanding your resource limitations and your needs to um, create content, right? Put marketing out there. So it might be great to be on the top five social media channels that where your audience gathers. First, I hope you've done the research to, to know where what those five are. But if you're resource constrained, then don't do it. Don't do those five things poorly. Do one really well and expand from there. And, you know, I think a lot of people um, make the mistake of on social media in particular, um, or even I'll just say uh, across marketing, you know, trying to put together an omni-channel marketing uh, uh, plan, which is, you know, to use a term that enterprise level folks use that small businesses probably shouldn't, um, that they feel like, well, I, I can just create this content once and publish it five times. And to some extent that's true, but there really is uh, there are pitfalls to doing that, and there's value to really understanding the specifics of a platform, its strengths, its weakness, um, what the community there is expecting, and adapt that same content uh, across those platforms. So that, you know, again, you talked a minute, minute or two ago about, um, you know, just sort of the basics of marketing, marketing 101. That's kind of, you know, very much a piece of that. Um, and then, of course, internally having systems to make it easy for you to to recreate and, and do what you do. And, you know, it, consistency does matter. If you set out to publish uh, a blog post um, every Tuesday morning, then do it every Tuesday morning. Your, your audience, you know, for the most part, except for your mom, they're not waiting by their inbox um, for notification every Tuesday morning that you've published something new, but they'll notice if it's six months go by and they haven't seen anything from you, right? Um, so you, you definitely want to make sure that you build those systems. And to me, that, you know, means thinking through what you're doing um, in sort of bulk fashion and putting together your ideas so that you can generate them together, whether that means taking a Saturday morning to do it or carving out time one day a week or, or two days a month just doing it together um, so that it gets done and you're not sitting there every Tuesday morning. I, I, I hate to admit this, but, you know, when I first started um, publishing our own content, that's what I did. You know, I was like, all right, every Tuesday and Friday, I'm going to publish something. And every Tuesday and Friday, I sat down to write it, which is just insanity, right? Like you're, you know, there's always a, a client conflict or something else that comes up or, you know, your car breaks down or whatever the case may be. So um Preparing for all that and making sure that you're aware of uh, what your limitations are so you can work around them. I think that's a good start. That's really such excellent advice. And I think a lot of people talk about consistency, but very few talk about sustainability because if you can't sustain it, obviously you're, the consistency means nothing um, and really understanding your limits. Uh, I don't know if you use any, do you, do you use like a project management software to manage your agency clients and all the different activities and tasks? 
Uh, yes and no. I, I, there's not a single tool I can recommend. We've kind of cobbled together over the years using a, a range of tools that uh, some of which we've kind of developed in spreadsheets and things like that, that really work for us. You know, we're not a high volume kind of, you know, we have uh, eight or 10 pro projects going on at a time beyond, you know, a much larger group of clients you know, on the website side that are we're doing maintenance for, which is, you know, a much you know, a lower, you know, a lighter lift. Um, so I don't, I don't have any specifics, but you bring up a good point, And that is have tools in place that make it easy for you to either work across the team or, um, and this may sound silly, but you make it, uh, obvious to you, you know, give you some sort of signal that, Hey, I'm taking off one hat and putting on another, right. Even as simple as, Hey, I've got to write this content, but then I've also got to edit it. So are there tools that can help me uh, differentiate between the tool two, um, uh, so that it, it, it just becomes just much more part of your system because uh, systems really are important. Yeah, I'm going to give uh, the listeners advice. So I started using one of these tools. There's a few of them out there. I started using ClickUp. And um, what's amazing is it, be, it allows you to think about well, what are the processes, what are the tasks, and then you can time them. It has a little time tracker. And you can really begin to understand, do I need to be doing this every day? Because the more content you create, the more you try to be active in social media and the need to be consistent and make it sustainable, you realize, you know what, maybe this is something I don't need to do every day, maybe every other day, right? So I encourage everybody, um, I am actually on the free ClickUp plan. There's a lot you can do for free. So I encourage you, there's monday.com, there's a bunch of them out there. But if you're ever curious, try to create a procedure for all the different marketing things you do and then time yourself doing each one of those tasks and I think you'll really begin to understand how much time all this is taking that you might not have realized and to be able to create something that's more sustainable. So um, thank you for allowing me to uh, talk about that. Um, it's It's been a real, I'm going to say it's been a game changer. Things like I used to have 50 Chrome tabs open and now I just have one place that I go to in ClickUp and it's like, you know what, this I'm going to check just once a week or this I'm just going to check once a month. And I put the reminder in there so that I know I need to check it in case I forget it. Um, and I know how long it takes me when I do it and you can plan your whole month. And anyway, so, uh, a great reminder about, uh, uh sustainability and systems and processes. So oh, that's great. Another thing, Sorry. yeah, no, another thing you mentioned, um, that if your, uh, business has a very, very small marketing team, and I'm sure a lot of the uh, listeners are in that category, they might be doing the marketing themselves. They might have one maybe two or three people, if content is really important, um, you talk about the benefits of having a great editor. So if you, you know, if content is so central, the messaging, uh, website, email, social media, all the content you create, but you don't have that skill set, um, what is your recommendation for how companies can um, you know, small businesses with small teams, how do they handle that situation and make sure they're putting out the best content? Well, if you really, really don't have that skill set, you've got to bring someone who does. Um, it, it, you're just not going to be effective if the content you're putting out there is subpar, if it's you know riddled with errors or riddled with typos. It just doesn't look professional. Not that we all don't make mistakes, um, but to do it consistently, um, people are going to are, are really going to be turned off. So. Uh, certainly, if you um, don't have the skills in house, uh, bring someone in. Um, ideally, you would do that in a way that allows you to grow into that role, right? So, um, yeah, in some ways, it's not fair to ask someone to come in and, and teach you how to do what they do. But if you're honest about that from the outset and say, hey, look, I can't afford to have you, you know, have this exp role expand in the foreseeable future. I need to keep it just to the minimum. And you need to help me figure out how I can take some of this on myself. Teach me what I should be doing, how I need to be doing it better. Um, beyond that, one of the things that I talk about in the book and something that I talk to clients about all the time, I've even, you know, tried to um, brainwash my children into thinking this way, which is, um, you know, create space, create distance and, and the difference between your writing role and your editing role. Uh, there's nothing new in this advice, but sit down and, you know, don't, don't even start with the writing role, start with the ideation, start with the brainstorming, if that's what you want to call it, um, and come up with the ideas and let it flow. And if you fill a page with it, great. If it's just noodling and bullet points and um, a basic outline, that's fine. Set it aside, 
come back the next day and write the article and don't worry about the typos and grammar and did you really tie this together as well as you could have, et cetera. And then in the third pass, at the very least, you can do the editing and turn it into something that's really sharp and polished. And that, um, for a lot of people, that can be really a surprisingly painful process, um, particularly that third step where they've written it and it, that was painful enough that going back to look at it again really is, you know, I don't want to say traumatic, but, you know, really does um, uh, I don't know, cause stress. But once you begin to get more practice at it, it becomes a really effective way to write if you don't have a, a team to, to help you do it. But it, it, the whole goal, of course, is a fresh set of eyes and even 24 hours, but, you know, ideally maybe a little bit more than that uh, in between passes can give you a fresh perspective on it. Yeah, you know, a lot of people in content marketing don't talk enough about the role of an editor. And if you've ever written a book for a publisher and seen how an editor can completely tear apart what you thought was a perfect chapter, uh, as I'm sure has happened to you and me and, and all the other authors, um, it, it is both humbling, but also it gets, I think, back to your original point. It's not about you. It's not about how great of a writer you may be. It's about that audience and is your message giving them a solution and having that extra set of eyes just tuned on making sure that your content is meeting that objective uh, is is a really, really great solution that is not talked about or valued enough, I think, in content marketing. So thank you for bringing that out. Since we're talking about content, and since this is very top of mind, probably after you publish the book, you might be getting asked this. If you haven't been getting asked this by now, I'm sure in the near future you will, but it's this role of AI in content creation. And I know as someone who is, you, you even said like you're a writer, I know you're probably very opinionated on this, um, but I think as marketers, we also sort of can't ignore the emergence of AI. So I'm really curious uh, as to your opinion, um, is this something that companies should look at using today? And if so, what are the areas in which you would recommend them use it? Or is it something where, you know what, it's not ready for prime time a year from now, or you should stay as far away from AI and make it as human as possible? What, what's your take? Um, so my take on that is it's complicated, <laughs> not surprisingly. <laughs> um, we have, of course, been playing around with uh, AI quite a lot, um, you know, because the, the first thing you read about it is it's coming for your job, um, you know, get ready to lie on the beach all day. And uh, I just don't think that's true. Um, it, it certainly will shift things as so many other technologies are. In some ways, it strikes me as being search engines, uh, taken to the extreme, right? It's just really fantastic at finding stuff for you immediately without making you sift through a search results page. Mm -hmm. uh, on another level, I look at it kind of the way, and I'm, I'll really date myself here, but, you know, um, desktop publishing software, if you remember those tools from We're way perfect. back. Yeah. We're perfect. One of the best pieces of software ever. Yeah, exactly. But it didn't put all the people out of business who, um, you know, made uh, newsletters and print pieces for everyone back in those days. Right. It uh, it devalued the um, the value of someone doing physical um, layout and and you know uh, work for for a piece. You know, no one's doing that anymore. And I think a similar thing is going to happen here. If you don't pay attention to these tools, then you are going to be underpriced and outperformed by your competitors who are using them intelligently. And of course, that last word intelligently is um, is the kicker here, right? Because I don't know how that works yet. Like we've um, we played around with everything from uh, as we've started uh, web development projects recently, there are a whole set of documents that we create specific to each project during discovery to ask questions about um, uh, strategy and goals and what's going to happen and uh, making sure we all understand what this website needs to do to succeed. And we started putting prompts in ChatGPT and a couple of other engines, and it spit back some pretty good stuff. Um, I was hoping it was going to, I mean, I was, I guess, nervous, but also hoping I was going to learn something. I was nervous that it was going to come back with these, you know, a discovery questionnaire document. I'm like, geez, we should have been using something like this for the last 20 years. Um, it didn't. It, it, it unearthed some things that like, oh, that's an interesting way to phrase that. I wonder if that wouldn't elicit better responses from, you know, clients who may not have this vocabulary. Um, and, you know, we've done that with a variety of documents and, you know, that's been interesting. We just for fun, I put through a prompt to ask it to write us a contract for a specific kind of engagement that we do. Um, it wasn't exactly like the one we're using, but it wasn't far off. 
Um, so, you know, that's that's sort of interesting. What to me, the evolution here, I think, will be um, and I hope will be not this broad search engine esque type tool, but for content creation to be able to create your own library, your own database, your work, your thinking, your ideas, and then ask it to, hey, write me 800 words on um, GDPR regulations uh, uh, in the style of me, right? I, I mean, to me, that seems much more interesting than, hey, just write me, you know, in 800 words on, on GDPR. Um, I, I just, I'm not sure how well that goes. And of course, I think all that's going to be influenced by the inevitable arms race that it's already started between the engines creating this stuff and the yeah. detectors that are, you know, are uh, bent on, 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 on not letting it happen. I love that idea of having this personalized AI that can tap into the blog post you've already written to understand your style and really just, just repurpose that content in an intelligent way on new subjects. I obviously we're, we're not even close to that uh, today. Um, but it's uh, it, it's really interesting how it is changing a lot of things. There there was a point I was going to talk about that I just completely forgot right now. But um, but yeah, uh, I, I see different companies approaching different ways, and I do agree that if you're not going to use it, your competitors are. And now I'm remembering that point. So I was at a uh, they call it generative AI when they talk about AI for content creation. I was at a conference last week put on by Jasper, who I believe to be one of the leaders in creating yep. you know, marketing uh, AI content. And there was a gentleman sitting next to me and he runs his own website agency, website design agency. And he was able, it really comes down to those prompts, as you know, there's actually titles of people, prompt engineering that are uh, being offered hundreds of thousands of, uh, you know, annual salary these days in Silicon Valley, apparently. Uh, but he uh, basically was able to fine tune these prompts to the point where he could pretty much you know, all the questions that need to be asked of new clients in order to build the website, he could pretty much automate it through getting responses to these prompts for each of his customers. And now he wants to productize that template for of other course. agents like yourself to use, right? So yeah. um, it's almost like this brand new world that is evolving uh, around these prompts. So I think that's a message for anyone listening is to understand when we talk about prompts, what does that mean? Um, and just to play around with it and find what might make it more optimal for you to uh, to use. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I think as long as you're, you know, understanding that you've got to add more value on top of what is now going to be able to be automated, you're, you'll be fine. Um, but if you're stuck just doing really mechanical stuff, your, um, your job and your livelihood probably are uh, at risk. Yeah. I almost equate it to, you mentioned, you know, desktop publishing software didn't put everyone out of business. I almost think, you know, Canva dumbed down Photoshop. It made everyone a graphic designer, like AI can make anyone a writer, but it didn't put graphic designers out of business. And right. in fact, there's been sort of a backlash, oh, back, uh, backlash in market, oh, that looks like any other Canva template, right? right. And uh, Instagram graphic alone won't cut it. You need to have short form video, right? Or you need to do something special with that graphic. So I think that's gonna be, come the same with content. It will raise the level in terms of depth of content you can write, but at the end of the day, it still has to speak to that person. Um, and that's where the magic is, yeah. Yeah, there's no emotion uh, in AI. So, um, and speaking of that, I want to get to one last point here before we wrap up, uh, uh, which is that marketing message of like jargon. And I know you have you're very opinionated on this. I think this is one of your pet peeves. So, um, and obviously when we talk about AI, I think it maybe some of it will spit out jargon that's commonly used, or maybe it won't spit out appropriate jargon. So, what is your take on? in your messaging, the use of jargon, regardless of what business or industry you're in? I'm a, a little uh, more uh, comfortable with it than it seems a lot of people are. There's uh, um, someone whose name I'm sure I'm sure you will know. I will not mention names if you want to. Uh, as I tell the story, you can maybe go Google and see uh, this post. But someone talked about how their local supermarket uh, had a sign up in the butcher's section that's saying, we'll spatchcock your chickens. And he thought that that was just silly and, and pointless use of jargon. And he said, well, how many people in that in that supermarket audience, this is, you know, a regular supermarket, not Whole Foods or some fancy high end market. How many people even know what that word means? And I, I, maybe it's because I do know what spatchcocking is uh, that I thought, mm, I don't know. Uh, you know, there's some portion of the audience. What? 
I don't know. You don't... I have no clue. I mean, I have an idea since you mentioned the context, but I don't know specifically right. what it means myself. Right. So it's you're basically breaking the chicken in half so it can lie flat on like a grill or something so that, you know, you're sort of deboning the chicken. Um, and yeah, there's a part of that audience that you've just completely missed, right? Like they, they just, they don't know what it means. They don't care. They like their chicken the way they like their chicken. Um, but there's another part of that audience who are looking at that and saying, huh, maybe I don't have to go to the fancy butcher down the street. I've got to come here to get produce and everything else. I'll get my chicken spatchcocked here. So I think something like that, where um, you let your audience know that you understand the language, I think that's a, a perfectly appropriate use of jargon. And here we can start talking about uh, you know buying processes and sales funnels. And you know as you get further along both, you better be talking the talk. You better be using the language that your audience is using and is expecting you to use because that's what's appropriate. Laying a whole lot of jargon on a piece of content meant that people who are just beginning their exploration, that's not going to work. Um, you sound like you're showing off and they're going to tune you out because they don't understand what it is anyway. So it's not it's not providing any value to them. But jargon can provide value. And I think that um, people shy away from it a little too often. Um, I don't need, you know, if you've worked in, in pharma, you know, the alphabet soup and, you know, all the acronyms that they have there. D don't use that. Anything that's sort of internal facing um, should remain internal facing, but your marketing tool, uh, the words that are being used by the, the people in the know, maybe not the general public. I think that's absolutely appropriate. Yeah, I think if any of you have um, teenage children, uh, they use completely different jargon than our generations use. So if you're targeting that audience, obviously you'll want to speak in a similar language. If you want to market your product in France, you want to speak French. So I think it's a great reminder. Uh, once again, we began this conversation focusing on the end customer, the target persona, and we sort of end it in the same way uh, from not just general content, but also to the specific language. So really great advice. Uh, Andrew, if people want to find out more about your book, more about your company, uh, where can they go? Andrewgo.com is uh, our website. You can find me on LinkedIn. Um, uh, I publish a lot of content there and you'll certainly find a lot of information about who we are, what we do, and of course, the book. We will put all this in the show notes. And it goes A-N-D-I-G-O.com. Uh, it sounds like your specialty is small business marketing. You work with a lot of B2B uh, companies. So if that, if you're looking for a partner, definitely contact Andrew. Thank you so much for your time today and sharing all of your expertise with us. Thank you.